Well, you know, really the first phase is just awareness raising. Right. I would say that most of the places that I've been to are still at the early awareness stage. They just don't even really know what it is or, or what it's for or how it works. And so I think there's a lot of presentations and discussion and dissemination that needs to be done initially just to raise awareness up to the level of, oh, this is a new, different, and important thing that we might want to consider doing ourselves. And then I do think that by now, you know, we're into like more than 10 years of having done this. And so now we know a lot of lessons learned. And so I just recently published what I call a national OER framework, which really is trying to present, let's say, to a country like yours, like Finland, you know, what would we need to think about? What are the success factors if we want to do OER nationally? This, historically, this has started like at the grassroots level, right? You or me might have started it just in our own classrooms. But now we're seeing this kind of higher level interest in adopting this practice on a more large scale. And so from a national OER framework perspective, what do I need to think about? And then I do think that uh, increasingly we're seeing a lot of quality assurance practices being put in place to ensure that the OER is of high quality. Often that includes peer review. Um, and, then, and then typically we get into some explorations around the pedagogy, open pedagogies. It's sort of uh, on the left hand side I think that we really, uh, so st at the very beginning I think it's very helpful to have a look at what is the strategic purpose around doing open education resources. It's, it has to have some bigger strategy than let's just do OER because we should be doing OER. It really does need to have a, a deliberate intent, a purpose behind it. And so for every country that I've been to so far, or every initiative, that purpose tends to vary and vary based on the needs of that region. Then I think you also need to look at um, things like incentives. How will we incentivize the transition from traditional ways of doing things to this? And in some places that involves money and other, you know, with grants, let's say, being provided. Uh, in others it involves um, a kind of motivations around transforming education and learning practices, improving learning outcomes. You were talking about that earlier. But there does definitely need to be some sort of thought given to what are the incentives that will engage people in doing this work. And I do think that you should ideally have some sort of research strategy that's going to evaluate this as you start to roll it out. And you also should be looking at the front end at things like policy. How would we rethink policy at the government or institutional level to enable this to happen? Because enabling it to happen sometimes requires overarching policy. And then I think you can move from there into, into looking at what is it that needs to happen within institutions. And so I would be highly recommending the formations of teams for open education resource uh, within institutions. And those teams would be made up of faculty, instructional designers, uh, media producers, librarians, education technologists. So this isn't a solo effort. It's a team effort to do this well. And then if I was thinking nationally, I'd be thinking across multiple institutions. And so I'd be looking at, can I form communities of practice where faculty in one discipline, let's say science, can speak to faculty in science at other institutions around the OER that they're either using or developing. And kind of do some peer-to-peer -peer exchange around that, coordinate even the development and use of it going forward. And I would look for communities of practice not only between faculty but librarians across multiple institutions, instructional designers across multiple institutions, because they all like to speak to each other and learn from each other in terms of what works and what doesn't work. And then when it comes to the actual content part, I think that you can think about it as a four-stage process. The first stage would be, do you have some existing curricula that works really well, that you're proud of, that could simply be licensed using Creative Commons licenses and made into OER, and then you're kind of underway right away, right? It doesn't really take it doesn't really take money. It just takes the will to kind of be willing to do that first step. And then the second step would be, is there, after 10 years, there's lots of OER out there. Are there some existing OER that our institution could begin to incorporate into our curricula and make use of ourselves? And if so, just go ahead and adopt it. Again, it's, the cost is maybe to find it, but there's no other cost. 
And then the third, third would be maybe you find some stuff, but it's not quite perfect, or it needs to be translated from the English to Finnish. Then, then okay, we do some adaptation of that work to make it fit our local context. But because it's OER, you have the right and permission to do that. You don't need to seek permission. You don't need to pay anybody. You can freely do that on your own. And then lastly, if you can't find anything and you don't have anything and you need something, then I would consider authoring. I think that the community building piece is still uh, at a at a very early stage as well. And because what we've seen historically is autonomous, independent production of OER that meets the needs of a particular institution that is released as OER in the hope that someone will use it, but without necessarily an expectation that it will be used. But now we're starting to see uh, more national initiatives, or in the US, more statewide initiatives, where there is very much a build, build out of community. And so the community part, I think, um, is enabled through uh, multiple forms. Uh, one form is often through a platform, an online platform of some kind, where you can enable discussion and sharing and, and exchange of materials back and forth and go through a kind of editing process as, as uh, OERs reviewed and adopted. And I think a lot of that now can be done online. It doesn't have to be done face-to-face. -face, but I also think that sometimes it's helpful to have some face-to-face -face convenings. And I would also say that eventually what I hope to see is that in uh, things like na national or international conferences where you tend to see faculty gather, for example, you know, let's say all the biologists come together from around the world, I think that we'll, we'll begin to see open education resources and education curricula be a theme within those international gatherings where there's already an established community of practice and this will simply become a component that's already discussed or that is added to the discussion of those existing communities. I think there's multiple ways of doing it and I think they all need to be, there isn't a single way. Well, I mean, at this event that we're here at the Open Education Conference in Washington, D.C., you'll hear a lot of the mantra being about saving students money. And certainly I think open education resources have a cost value proposition, which, which is very much the case. Um, but, but I would say that, that that value proposition doesn't work everywhere in the world. I, I was just in the Middle East, for example, and so uh, saving students money just really isn't an issue. It's that, that value proposition doesn't resonate there. And, so, and I think that to some extent we do the open education space a disservice by focusing just on that value proposition because I think that ultimately the real value proposition is going to end up being what is it pedagogically that we can do now with an open resource that we couldn't do before when we just had closed resources. And we're just starting to see some exciting things emerge around that, particularly with students themselves being engaged in creating education content that will be used in the course by other students rather than just being recipients of education content that's been authored by faculty or publishers. Uh, I was brought in as part of a team by the World Bank to write a concept paper on how openness and the use of open practices might enable a more scalable and sustainable set of global food practices around the world. This was a particular challenge because um, for the Global Food Safety Initiative, it's really a public-private partnership arrangement. So you not only have universities that maybe have curricula dealing with global food safety practices, but you also have private entities whose business is perhaps providing training or devising procedures, all of which they sell. And so when it comes to the for-profit industry sector, engaging them in open education resources and open practices is particularly challenging because they view it as a threat to their business model. And of course, they don't want to jeopardize revenue by, by utilizing open practices. So 
This that actually um, led me to do some really interesting work around how you might conceptualize a business model for a private sector organization as well as public sector organizations. Yeah, so the initial focus will be in three sectors, if you will. Um, I'm going to profile um, organizations involved with open education resources but also organizations involved with open access on the research journal side and organizations in the open data space. So it'll be open education resources, open access, and open data will be the three initial areas of focus. The for-profit sector, the non-profit sector, to institutions, to government, to organizations, all of whom um, are exploring openness and want to potentially transition to a more open set of practices. So I'm hoping the model can be used not only with new startups that don't currently exist as a means of defining what a new startup business model might look like, but also be used with for-profit and non-profit and NGOs and so on to help them figure out how they might um, transition their current kind of closed practices to be more open while still surviving as an organization. So, I mean, the open business model really is, is trying to get to the root of that question. One of the most frequent questions I've received over the years in the open education resource space is, you know, how do I make money doing this? How do I generate enough revenue to keep the lights on, to pay for my home, my family? If I'm giving away things for free, how am I going to make a living? You know, those are the sort of fundamental questions that most people typically have. And of course, those questions are all rooted in our kind of competitive, market-driven world that we currently are in. And this notion of sharing and giving things for free is kind of the antithesis of money being the driver. And so, um, so what I've been working on is looking at what is meant by the phrase business model. So when we say business model, do we share a common understanding of what that references? And um, as part of that kind of investigation work, I have um, decided to adopt something called the Business Model Generation Handbook, which is a, a, a kind of book that was authored by over 400 people from 45 different countries, which lays out nine building blocks for what a business model is comprised of. Everything from, you know, what's your value proposition to how do you produce and create goods to how do you distribute them, what's your revenue stream. You know, there's a set of underlying building blocks that we would say make up a business model. But what I've done is kind of remixed that a little bit and tweaked it a little bit to add a, another component, which really, given that I work for Creative Commons, looks at the open licensing of things as being an inherent part of what I'll call this open business model. So I've added in the Creative Commons licensing of goods or works that are being produced by that business as a core component to what makes an open business model. And then what I've done is started to take that framework, that open business model framework, which now has 10 building blocks instead of the original nine, and started to analyze existing organizations that are operating as open businesses and tease out for those existing businesses, what are the components of their business that, that address each of the building blocks. And when you start doing that, you begin to surface the, the strategies and the tactics that these businesses are using to succeed as open businesses. And I would say that many of those boil down to <laughs> leveraging the reduced cost that the internet has provided in terms of enabling creation of goods, production of goods, distribution of goods. And not necessarily having all of those done in-house by your own staff is one of those kind of generalizable strategies that I think would apply to most open business models. One of the responses I would have to that is that it doesn't necessarily mean, going to an open business model doesn't necessarily mean that you will become unprofitable and not generate revenue. But how you generate revenue and with whom, because often it's done in partnership now. So uh, for example, I, I did a, I, I've looked at the Noun Project, which is a really interesting open business. They develop icons using graphic designers 
which they then make available on the web. You can download them for free, or if you want to use them without uh, giving attribution, because they're all Creative Commons licensed, you actually have to pay a fee. So, so one of the interesting things about the Noun Project is that they ended up drawing on graphic designers who are distributed all over the world, none of whom work for the Noun Project, but who are avid graphic designers and are producing some amazing symbols and icons. And so the Noun Project has acted as a sort of centralized organization that is collectively gathering works from all these creators who are distributed all over the world, and then acting as a distributor of those resources and a collector of funds by users who want to use those resources. And then the, what they've done is shared a portion of those funds go to the designer, and the portion of those funds support the operation of their own company. So I think there's some interesting things to look at there. Um, one is it's a new company, didn't exist before, and their business model involves tapping into expertise that's distributed globally and making use of those people as sort of their core creators rather than hiring or, uh, designers to, to create these icons themselves. They're just making use of people who already do this out in the world at large. It's a more distributed model, less centralized, and it also involves revenue sharing. So rather than the company keeping all revenue for itself, it shares the revenue with the people around the world that it's partnering with who are helping it exist as a business in the first place.